Today we're going to do two things. So if you're watching today, or if you, you know somebody comes in other than us, they'll enjoy this. We're going to have something small for the kids. So if you have kids at home, you can have them watch this also. Just a little message that we'd like to give the kids. Sometimes we forget about preaching the kids, or we limit it to Sunday school. We really feel here in this church it's important to include children in worship. So we want them to sing with us, and we want to include them in our teaching. Um, and the other thing we're going to do is we're going to spend just a few minutes today talking about um, whether God hears you. And I don't mean that in the sense that, you know, we all know that we've heard, we've grown up here in churches that God listens to our prayers. Um, but sometimes we don't think God is listening. Uh, sometimes without realizing it, we could be cursing God and saying, where are you? We're going to talk about a case in the Bible that, um, that this, this happened uh, and some scriptures that will help us to really think about, you know, what we need to do so that... We hear God, right? God could be talking to you right in front of your face and you could be missing it. So uh, we want you to be thinking about those things today. But first, we're going to enjoy some music together and we're going to sing and worship.
Now these two are going to play. Ready? Okay? So let's see who wins between Grandma and Mia. You got it. Oh, so did she just win you that fast? What happened? Try it again. Wait. You guys aren't doing the same. It's one, two, three. Okay, it's on your third one. One, two, three. Ha ha! Okay, so let's call Mia the Chance. Mia the Chance. Okay, so while you're up here for just a minute, I want to tell you why I did that. Okay? And if you give me just a few minutes, we'll have you sit back there, you'll be comfortable. But I, I just want to take a few minutes and I want to share something with you. Okay? Are you ready? Mia, you'll probably get this pretty quick. So, so you play the game, um, rock, paper, scissors. I don't have to tell you how because you know how. We just went over it together. You know what wins. Rock smashes the scissors, papers covers the rock, and the scissors does what? Cut it, cuts the paper. Cuts the paper, very good. Okay, so we play, and me as the grand champion <laughs> for rock, paper, scissors. All right. Um, the greatest thing about the rock and the paper and the scissors, you ready for this? Mm -hmm. Is that you can be a winner no matter what you choose. You, you, right? You can be a winner with the rock, or you can be a winner with the paper, or, shaker. or the scissors. You can be a winner with any of them you choose, okay? Whatever you choose, you can be a winner. So. If we were to have a rock, paper, and a scissors here on the table, which I was going to put up here. If you made a scissors and you have paper, you would win. The paper wins, right? If you make a rock, if we had a rock, uh, then the rock would win uh, over the scissors, like I'm talking about. Here's the greatest thing. No matter what you choose, you could be a winner. Isn't that neat? It's a game everybody can play. You don't have to be the strongest person in the world. You don't have to be the smartest person in the world. You have three things that can make you win the game. Now, each one of those things are really important, right? What does the paper do? The paper covers the rock, the rock right? What does the scissors do? It cuts the paper. Cuts Jesus. Cuts the paper. Cuts Jesus. It cuts the paper. I yeah, cuts the paper. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So you know. They are all useful in their own way. Now, if you wanted to write a letter, let's see how you, you get this. Okay? If you wanted to write a letter, uh, would you use a rock, a scissors, or a paper? Paper. Paper. Would the rock help you much in writing a letter? No. Would the scissors help you to write a letter? No. Not really, right? Just the paper would help you, right? Okay. Um, if you wanted to go cut an angel out of a paper, uh, would the rock or the paper help you? No. no. What would help you? Scissors. Scissors. Scissors is the only thing that would help you, right? Okay. If you were really thirsty and you needed a drink of water, a piece of paper and the scissors, would that help you much? No. You can choke her. You're like, what? <laughs> of course a piece of paper and the scissors wouldn't help me drink water. But a rock would. What? Could. Oh. How? How? You're like, how would that happen? Yeah. How would a rock be exactly what you need if you're thirsty? Yeah. That makes no sense. Okay. It doesn't make any sense, right? Well, we're going to read something today that makes it make sense. And it's just going to take a second. It's a story. Okay, wait. You're looking at me like I'm nuts. Especially you. <laughs> Don't you think a rock would be helpful if you need a drink of water? No. I'm thinking about Let's take a vote. Who thinks a rock would be helpful if we had to get a drink of water if I'm thirsty? Who would? Anybody? No takers, right? I'm the only one with my hand up. <laughs> okay. Well, in our Bible lesson today, for you kids that are watching, and for you parents who are watching with them, uh, this is exactly what happens. A rock helps people when they got thirsty. You probably never read it in the Bible. 
but I'm going to read it to you, and then I'm going to say a couple things about it, and then you can go sit down, okay? I want you to learn this today. There was a man in the Bible who had a bunch of people following him, and uh, they were in a wilderness, and it was a deserty area, and all the people had no water to drink in this area, and they were getting thirsty. How many days do you think you could make it with no water in your body? Go ahead. What do you think? How many days? Ten. You think ten? Well, that's a good guess. What do you think? I think two. I mean three. You think two days? I think three. Somebody whispered in your ear, didn't they? So two, three days. Uh, you're, in, you're in serious trouble if you don't drink water that fast. You have to have some kind of moisture water in your body in three days. Okay? It's, it's really important to do that. Well, now let me read you this story. And it'll only take a second. There's only, it's just a small little part here. Okay? Nope, just hear me out. And here they are in the wilderness in this desert. And the people thirsted there for water. All the people were thirsty, like for water, which you're drinking. And the people murmured against Moses, who was leading them, and said, Why did you bring us out here in this desert? There's no water. There's no cattle for our animals. They had animals and everything. There was no water. And if they didn't get any water, what was going to happen to them? They would die. They would die. That's right. Moses cries out to God. This is what it says. Moses cries unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They are almost ready to stone me. So what were the people going to do to the leader? Stone He let them out there. What were they going to do? They kill them, right? They were going to stone him, which means they were going to throw rocks at him until he was dead. Yeah, that's what they wanted to do. Okay. And the Lord said to Moses, now this is where the rock comes in. It's a very small story in the Bible. And the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people and take with thee the elders. Or he wanted him to take the older men of Israel. And the rod, he had a rod, like a stick, right? A rod. Wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. So he says, he says, the same rod you used in the river, I want you to go take that rod and go. And he says, Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, or you should hit the rock, right? He said, You should hit the rock, and there will come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And what do you think happened? Water came out of the rock. Wow. And he called the name of the place Masa and Meribah because of the striving of the children in Israel and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or is he not? So they didn't think God was going to help them. Okay, here we go. Our Bible lesson today is about the rock that God used <coughs> to give them water. Let me ask you a question. What's it like when you feel hungry or thirsty? Excuse me. When you're thirsty, what, what do you feel like? What do you feel like? I feel like my throat is like dry. Yeah. Good? Yeah. What do you feel like? I feel like I'm thirsty. That's a good description. How do you feel when you're thirsty? You feel thirsty. That's the best description. I like water. If you want water, your body longs for water. Anxiety. Anxiety. And your voice yeah. Being thirsty is uncomfortable. It can give you a headache. It can make you dizzy. The human body has to have water every day, multiple times a day, to stay healthy, energetic, and fresh. Moses led the Israelites out of slavery into the desert. And the Israelites were more and more thirsty. The situation was getting very serious for them. Uh, and they complained to Moses. So Moses went to his tent and he fell on his knees and he prays to God and God answers and Moses did exactly what God said. Did you notice that? God said, take this stick, go up to this mountain, this rock. Okay, and he did exactly what God told him to do. After he struck the rock, what happened to the rock? Water just came out of the rock. Weird, right? Think, how did that happen? God made it happen. 
water began rushing out of it, enough to quench the thirst of all the people and all their animals. And just in time, you know why? Because right after that, a nation showed up and their army had to fight these people. So they were able to get nourished just in time and God showed up and helped them. Now, we learn a lot from this story before we, we, we quit here. When you face an impossible situation, let's say there's something going on in your life that's hard. And sometimes we go through like, right? Maybe even though you guys are little, maybe you go through hard times or things that you just can't control, right? And it, it's going to happen as you get older. You're going to go through these times. We do. We still do. We can go to God like Moses did. We can ask Him to help us. God help us, right? And we can ask Him for His help, and God can do crazy impossible things. Like making water come out of a rock. That's what God can do. He can make things happen that we can't make happen. That's what God can do. Ah, okay. So when we do that, we say, Dear God, when we face impossible situations, you say, Dear God, help us remember Moses. To remember Moses, God. And know that we serve a God who can get water from a rock like that. And in Jesus' name, that's how you pray. If you ever have a problem like that, that's your lesson for today. That's where I want you to go. Okay, yes? When you cry, you make water. When you cry, you do make water, right? So maybe your eye would come in handy to make water. Okay, so if you guys want to go back and sit down, that's fine. And I'm going to, now I'm going to give a message to uh, some of the adults that I promised them. So bear with me. Or you guys can sit up here. You guys are welcome to be close. You don't scare me one single bit, Mia. I promise. All right. Just want to take a few minutes and um, focus on the kids and give them a little story. Give me a hug. All right. All right. Go ahead and have a seat back there. Okay. Jojo. Jojo. I want to start off. What are you hear? What are you hear? What are you hearing? Once there was a man who dared God to speak. Was it you? Once there was a man who dared God to speak. Burn the bush like you did for Moses, God, and I'll follow you then. Once there was a man who dared God to collapse the walls like he did for Joshua. God, and then I will fight. Still the waves like you did on Galilee. God, and then I will listen. And so the man sat by the bush. He sat near a wall. He placed himself close to the sea, and he waited, and he waited for God to speak. God, this is what I want you to do. God, burn the bush, bring the walls down, still the waves, do it, God, and then I will follow you. And there he sat, he sat. The man sat for hours, days, and he sat, and he waited for God to speak, and God heard the man, so God answered. God sent fire, not a bush, to this man, for a church. He brought down a wall, not of the brick, but of sin. He brought down sin, God answered him. He stilled the storm, not of the sea, but of the souls that were saved. And then God waited. And God waited for man to respond. And he waited. And God waited. And God waited. And he waited. But the man was looking at bushes, not at the hearts, bricks, and not lives. Seas, 
and not souls. So he decided that God said nothing. Uh, that he had done nothing. Finally, he looked to God and said, What's wrong, God? Have you lost your power? And God looked at him and said, Have you lost your hearing? That's from a book entitled Gentle Thunder by Max Lucado. This might be one of the most important things you hear. First of all, the things you hear are powerful. The things that you, you hear, the information you take in, form your decisions and your actions. If any motivational speaking helps you, I hope that you listen clearly to the fact that what you hear creates who you are, your family, and the community around you. Thoughts are powerful. Uh, we take them and we meditate on them, we nurture on them, we nurse them, and they become huge. We come to conclusions. We make decisions. We take actions on things that we've seen and that we've heard and that we've read. And then guess what happens to you when you do that? You become trapped in a way of being based on what you've taken in. This could be good for you or it could be very bad for you. Have you ever seen a child, someone you look up to, a coach, a parent, and they tell them something negative about themselves? Ah. Proverbs 23, 7, what does it say? I know some of you know it. I've been quoted it a couple times lately. Proverbs 23, 7. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7. And this is what it says. For as he thinketh in his heart, so it is he. Eat and drink, saith as to thee, but his heart is not with thee. And what is the expression that comes from? Man thinketh, thinks. So is he. So is he. Very good. It speaks of the power of words that become your thoughts, either positive or negative ones. So just like the God desires to speak to you and reform you and help you, your mentality, and reframe some things in you, who else wants to do the same? Who else wants to do that? If God wants to do it, who else wants to reform you and reframe you into doing some things? Not God. God does. And who else? The devil. I want you to remember, you're not, God's not alone in this, trying to influence you. God's not the only one there for you. God's not the only one shadowing you. God's not the only one following you. Uh, the devil uses truth, fake news. He employs shame, your past, insecurity to form thoughts and become entrenched in your identity. And you began to own them. You begin to. You live, you live them out. If somebody tells you that you're a loser enough, what happens to you? You start to believe it. You believe it. And don't forget uh, that all those actions after that are firmly based on what they have accepted because they've been called a loser. Uh, it happens all the time. <coughs> So I want to read this scripture to you today, and I want to leave this thought with you. This is taken from Isaiah 55. Isaiah chapter 55 and verses 8 and 9. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways my ways, saith the Lord. 
For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. What essentially does that verse say? Do we think like God? No. Do we reason like God? No. Our human form, uh, especially in its sinful nature, God's thoughts are way higher than ours. Um, the world and culture that we're living in requires a different level of thinking, perceiving, and discernment. That's the world that we're living in. It requires some supernatural thinking. It takes a different level when you are contending with who? The devil. You're especially challenged. And I want you to remember this. You are especially challenged. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. There is a war on you. On your thought, thoughts in life. Both natural thoughts and spiritual thoughts. There's a war on you. Playing on you. And you've got Satan trying to help you with some good thinking processes. And you've got Satan, his opposer, on the other side, following you around and trying to control you. Uh, John chapter 8 and verse 44 says of the devil, You are the father of the lie, and your will is to do, you are, you are of your father the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of the lie. So when you hear things, I want you to ask yourself, where did that come from? What's feeding me? What's motivating you? What's driving you? What's shaping you? What are you listening to? What are you watching? What are you taking in? What is making you? The Bible says that God, God wants to form your mind. He wants to transform your thoughts and get you thinking the right way. He wants to get you thinking right. Have you ever heard someone say, think right, get right, think right? Colossians 3, 2 says, set your mind on the things of above and not on the things of the earth. You may think this is hard because I'm on the earth. It's hard. It could be hard for you. You might have shaped a different self of you you don't want to see anymore. It could be hard, it's true. But it is also true that if we believe and trust in Jesus, you're sealed in Him. You're sealed into a heavenly a place, a promise where the filter is different. And I want you to think about that. If, if your goal is, is eternity, the filter there is different. And I'm not, I'm not sure a lot of us would fit in. So God says he's willing to help you right now. To help your thoughts and help your thinking right now. Uh, you have a different vantage point if you listen to God. And because we are representing a kingdom not made with human hands, as the scripture states, it's important for us to give God the attention that he is due when he speaks. Are we hearing him? The Bible says, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So we're trying, we're trying, uh, we're trying to get a better mind. We're trying to put on Christ as we've accepted him into our hearts. Romans 12, 2. 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed to the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This morning I gave a testimony. I'm not going to uh, share all the details, but it really had to do with some early changes that I had to go through. And uh, God really does transform your thinking. And if he doesn't transform your thinking, we're stuck in a world we don't want to be in and a world that has nothing for us. You can make your mind new in Christ. Um, you can make your mind whole in Christ. How does it happen? How does God change your mind? First of all, let us let me just enforce this thinking, this thought. God wants to speak to you, and He wants to. God wants to speak to you. He wants to help you think right. I know there's some people out there that are going to hear this that know they're not thinking right. Uh, God, God may be speaking to you, and you just may not be hearing Him. Hearing from God to some believers is almost second nature. I can hear when God talks to me. I'll tell you one thing right now. God is telling me to do something right now. In the last couple days, that might be hard for me. And I'm not going to share it with you because it's personal. For the last couple days, he's been telling me to do something. God could be telling you to do something. If you open your mind and your heart, you could be hearing him. Do it. Open your mind to the nature of God speaking to you. Hearing from God to some believers is almost second nature. We can hear it. We can hear God pulling at our heart. Um, they've been mentored well, coached well. And honestly, <clears throat> that's what God does to you when you come to church. He mentors you. He coaches you. It might take a while, and then one day you wake up, you, think, you know, I think God's telling me to do something. <laughs> And you just feel like that's between you and God. That's okay. God starts speaking to you. We're almost to the end of this already. Um, just because you show up with a basketball in your hand, does that mean you can play basketball? Nope. No. Mia, right? Can't just because you show up, right? If you take a baseball to school, does it mean you're going to be the best player on the team? No. No. What if I put the best, nicest shoes on? Maybe I got some nice high top. What are good basketball shoes? Huh? What are good basketball shoes? Jordans. Jordans, right? Maybe I put some great expensive Jordans on. I go out to the court. I got to be a winner, right? That wouldn't help me much. <laughs> ah, it's not going to make me the best basketball player. I can have the shoes. I can put the clothes on. I can, I can show up to the court. But there's some fundamentals. There's some fundamentals you could miss. There are some believers that attempt to hear God, but they have no guardrails. Second Corinthians, uh, excuse me, they have no guardrails sorry, or fundamentals. They're not discerning what their thoughts are, God's thoughts are, or the devil. So who do we have? We have God, we have the devil, and you have yourself, right? You're kind of, you want to lean towards this way, right? Because God's over here, right? You want to lean towards God. But you got to remember, there's the devil, yourself, and God. And there's a lot of thinking that goes on in your life. Um, there's a lot of thinking that goes on in your life. Some are not discerning where thoughts are coming from. Are they coming from the devil? Are they coming from God? Or are we just coming up with random stuff that don't matter ourselves? The Bible says in... Uh, The Bible says, for example, um, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Now the reason I, I, I'm, I'm sharing this verse with you is because some, some end up with a wingnut ministry. A wingnut ministry. That's where they say, God is telling me to do something crazy. Crazy. God told me, for example, and this is a true story, <clears throat> man felt that God told him he didn't need to work. Mm -hmm. he, didn't, he didn't want God, this man to work. God didn't. That's what the man said. Now, do you think that's coming from God, the man, or the devil? The devil. 
Well, we know it's not coming from God because we know how God feels about work, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So it's got to be over here, right? It's got to be myself. Maybe I don't want to work, right? <laughs> Sounds better when I say God doesn't want me to work. But it could be the devil too. That's just an example of someone declaring that God tells them to do something. But there's a bunch of scriptures that come to mind that like it says that anyone not willing to work shouldn't eat. That's in the Bible. We hear that anyone walking in idleness, not busy at work, that's verse 11 of 2 Thessalonians 3. 2 Thessalonians 3. Anyone who's not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Christ to do their work quietly and earn their own living. That's what it says. <clears throat> I'm not giving a message today on work. But I'm giving the message about listening to God. False claims where God's involved when it's obviously not. And, and how do you get the filter? Well, you've got to know what God would even have you thinking about, right? You can figure out where positive natural thoughts come from. Uh, okay. The other hand of the diligent will rule, while the slothful will be forced to labor. For example, uh, Proverbs 12, 24. So on that subject... Okay, so get this out of the way. The primary way God speaks to you is how? Let's see if anybody can hit on this. Through your heart? Okay, He can speak to you definitely through your heart. But when you think about, when someone says, what does God say about that? How do you find out what He says about it? The Holy Spirit. Okay, what else? Mr. Read the Bible. Okay, the Bible, right? All that's going to lead you to where? His Word, right? Which is the Bible. So, okay. The primary way God is going to speak to you is His Word. That's it. His written Word, the Bible. Some of you are reading it a lot at home and studying at home. Some of you get it when, when you come to church. But I just want to tell you that it's important that you do it as much as you can. And, when you, and if you just don't come to church or read your Bible, you're setting yourself up for failure. But that's not the only way God speaks to you. God will never violate His written Word. And when I'm hearing from God, the Word is the measuring rod by the temple by which I judge it. So if I'm hearing something and the Bible is showing something different, I automatically know guess, who, guess who's that's coming from over here, right? Uh, the devil or myself. But it may not be coming from God if it's not in the Scripture. That's my, that's my filter. <clears throat> <coughs> However, that is, that is not the only way God is going to speak to you. Okay. It has always been the character of our God to speak and to communicate, to be relational with man. And God does want to change your mind. I know right now that God is speaking to somebody that's not here today. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but I have had a conversation with an individual where, where, he, where this person says, I know God is speaking to me. God is telling me this. God wants you to change. God speaks to you about change. God pulls you towards change. Why? Our carnal mind is not aligned right with God. It's not in an agreement with, with God. Remember the earlier passage in Isaiah chapter 55 we read? For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Your ways are not my ways, declares the Lord. For the heavens are higher than the earth. So are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So how does God change your mind? We're almost done here. How does God change your mind? His Word. The Bible says of the world of God that it is active, sharp, that the Bible is inspired, that, that God breathed the Spirit into the Word. His Word formed all of creation, spoke of light and darkness, was separated. All Scripture is inspired of God. God has put into the Bible what He wants you to hear. What He wants you to hear. Do you know that there are some names in the Bible that were left out of the Bible? You, you'll have all these characters in the Bible, but there might be one character 
that you're not sure about. Uh, let me give you an example. This morning we talked about Lot's wife. What's her name? Isn't that something? I don't think the Bible says her name. Now, now worldly sources, right? When I say worldly, I'm talking about history books, other, other forms of history um, archives have registered a couple names that they feel her name might be. But, but if God wanted her name to be known, guess where it would be? In the Bible. In the Bible. The woman who looked back and turned into Saul. We don't know her name. Isn't that amazing? God has placed into the scriptures what he wants you to hear for a reason. He wants you to know you don't need to remember her. You just need to remember that she looked back. That's how God is talking to you. He tells you exactly how he wants you to remember it. It's amazing to me. Uh, I heard that story and I thought of this outline. <clears throat> All scripture is, was, was authorized by God that the Spirit of God breathed into the verse. Verses. Amen. The very breath that took a man formed by dirt and breathed life, that spirit force is the same force that helped uh, to write the Bible. So stop treating the Bible like a math book. You could be doing that. I think we, a lot of us have done that. We, we treat it like a math book and we, we need to start reading it like a love story. A love story. That's what Adrian Rogers said. Stop treating the Bible like a math book and start reading it like a love story. Because in the end, it's beautiful. Uh, uh, this is what I read, so I'm going to share this with you before we quit. Okay? What happens when you read the Bible four times a week? Four times a week, if you read the Bible, what happens? This is what one pastor did, and this is based on a study. This is what he said. Feelings of loneliness drop 30%. Feelings of loneliness drop 30%. Are you lonely? Are you reading the Bible? Drop 30%. That's huge, right? Anger issues. <clears throat> you think you got them? Anger issues. If you read the Bible just four days a week, or four, um, four what did I say? Four times a week at some point. Uh, do a devotional in the morning, something. Four times a week. You got anger issues? It'll drop by 32%. 32%. Bitterness in relationships. You got uh, relationship problems? 40%. It'll drop by 40%. Alcoholism, what do you think? What do you think the percentage on alcoholism is if you're putting the Bible first during the week? If you're, if you're listening to God through the scripture, alcoholism drops 57% over half. You're putting God in your life through the scripture. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60%. Viewing porn drops 61%. Sharing your faith jumps by what? Oh, he suggests 200%. 200%. Sharing your faith because you're sharing your thoughts. You're taking it in your shame. So this is something I really want you to pray for. You can pray for guidance, compassion, empathy, discernment. I want you to pray for wisdom. We need it. The process of prayer can bring humility as we recognize we're limited in our thinking. And we need God to help us to cross over into His limits. The Holy Spirit will bring a conviction of sin that sets you again on the right path. I'm just going to close with this. Uh, I'm going to read this again and I want you to ask yourself, is this me? Is this me? Because if it's not, get to church. I can't, I can't give you all the information here in a message that's going, to, that's going to save you. Jesus is the only one that can save you, except in, in your heart is what's going to save you. I can't change your mind in a million different directions until you have the Holy Spirit to work on you. And I feel the church is the way that God does it. I feel that way because it happened. So I want, to, I want to read this to you. I want to ask you, is this you? Here we go. You ready? I just want to read it to you. Here it is. Once there was a man who dared God to speak. You ever done that? Yes. Come on, God, speak up. Show me something. Who 
two of us haven't said that to God. Once there was a man who dared God to speak. Burn the bush like he did for Moses, right? God, and then I'll follow you. Have you ever said that? Who of us haven't said that? God, get this done for me, I'm tired. And then I'll follow you, right? Like the walls of Jericho, there once was a man who dared God to speak, collapse the walls like you did for Joshua, God, and I will fight for you. You want me to show up and fight for you, God? Fight for me, collapse these walls. I'm looking at these walls, I can't get through, I can't get anywhere, then I'll fight for you. You want God to listen to you, wait for him to react to you. Still the waves like you did on Galilee. Remember God did that? Still the waves, God, like you did on Galilee, and then I will listen to you. Remember, God, when you help these people in the Bible, where are you? I need you. Have you ever said anything like that? And so the man sits by the bush, he sits near the wall, he sits close to the sea, and he just waits. And he waits for God to do it. He wants to see it. He wants to see something huge. He waits for God to speak. Well, God hears man and all of his plight. And God answers. God does send a fire, but it's not the one he wanted. God does bring a wall down, but it's not the one he wanted. God does still the storm of a sea, but it's not the one he wanted. <coughs> and when God sent fire down for a church, and when God brought down a wall of sin so that you could live in eternity, and when God stilled the storm of the sea of the soul, God waited, and he waited for the man, and waited for him to respond, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited. And because the man was looking at the bush and not the hearts, and because the man was looking for bricks and not lives, and because he was looking at the sea and not the souls, he decided God didn't do anything. God didn't hear, but God did hear, right? Finally, he looked to God and said, have you lost your power? And God looked at him and said, have you lost your hearing? Because God is speaking. That's all I have to say. Just praying that God does a miracle in someone's heart and you'll open up your ears enough to hear. Amen. So.